and we are live. We're not we're not an at home produ- we are an at home production, but we have some music today. <laughs> Thank you, Marie Iglesias, for your recommendation. Let's get some music going, guys. I have the link, by the way, to all of YouTube's non-licensed music. So if you want to play music on your videos, still monetize YouTube, not get shut down on Facebook. You need this link. Send me a direct message. I'll send it to you. As I realize I don't really have a way to fade this out, I'm going to do it old school. Oh, yeah. Everything's manual. I'm a one-man show right now. All right. I'm very excited today uh, to have a good buddy of mine. He's been on the show many times. Steve Bick is here. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Nice to be here. It is. Yeah, virtually. <laughs> that's that was our only option, man. Um, you know, with this amount of things going on in the world, you know, I would have you in studio in a heartbeat. Um, but you know, studio just not really an option right now. Um, so this is this is where we're at. This is the new economy, the new world that we're living in. Um, is is this? A lot of people are getting on Zoom. A lot of people are figuring out how to operate their business. Uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out what's you know what's next in the world of technology, in the world of um, you know executing business. And I do want to get a quick disclaimer on here. Uh, Steve is a portfolio manager. You can see his um, accreditations there. The information discussed here is not an offer to sell or solicitation to buy any securities or investments presented, but is solely the opinion of the presenter. So I just want to get that out there. Um, so Steve, first and foremost here, I know you are a well-traveled gentleman. And um, you're from South Africa. You, I know you own real estate in uh, in the UK, or at least you did at one point. Um, coronavirus. This is obviously the cause, or at least the, our reaction to it is the cause of a lot of the issues that are going on in the financial world right now. I'm pulling up on the screen the total cases right now: nine hundred twenty-seven thousand nine hundred sixty-eight in the world. Forty-six over forty-six thousand deaths so far. In in your opinion, you know, have have you seen stuff like this? Like, what are your thoughts on coronavirus, just based on what you know? Well, I mean, I've obviously got people all over the world that I talk to on this, and you've got the doctor and the medical staff side of it, which is a pandemic, as we know, and it's shut everything down across the world. And uh, the the death toll is definitely climbing, and they're trying to stop the spread of it. But certainly, the way they've gone about it, which is to shut down essentially the global economy, I think is going to have some significant fallout in terms of businesses, the way we operate going forward. And I think there's going to be even a, a bigger effect and impact on business than the uh, ultimate death toll and the impact on the lives of the people that are taken so i don't I, I don't know it's hard to really understand whether this is justified or not i know certainly they're saying if we're all back to work this would spread like wildfire um but the percentage of deaths versus the uh, loss of business and uh, the whole market as a as a whole in basically the general econo- economy the global economy as a whole is uh, going to be significant i'm not sure how what the impact will ultimately be but i'm just watching it slow down by a day every day just gets worse and worse yeah i mean have you have we ever seen a situation uh where the global economy was essentially put put on pause i mean i've never yeah. seen a situation i mean even because i'm thinking back even to the crash Um, We didn't really see things slow down. Things changed. There was, you know, things were happening, but people were still going to work. People were still trying to make it happen. They still had a chance to go out there. And that's a totally different scenario. But I've personally never seen a situation like this. Um, And I don't know how we could possibly predict what the fallout will be. I just know that we've got some pain coming. And in fact, yesterday, you know, the president said that. He said, you're going to see, and I know you don't like the president necessarily, Steve. I remember this. Uh, but uh, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on how he's handled it. But he said we're, we're in for a very painful two weeks, two to three weeks. And he also said they, they guesstimated yesterday that we're going to have a minimum of 100,000 deaths in the United States, up to 240,000 deaths in the United States. That's what their modeling is showing them. So that's kind of what they're looking at to make these decisions right now. Yeah, I know. I know it's, uh, it's going to be serious. And then on the business front, I mean, I think a lot of people were expecting us to be able to go back to work after Easter, and that's getting pushed further and further and further away. And certainly as a business owner, and I've got a number of businesses, I've got uh, a number of people that own businesses across the globe, 
And yes, you can work from home like you're doing, and there's a few uh, businesses that can continue to operate that way. But what we're finding is every day that goes by, CEOs across the world are just trying to pull in their uh, pull on their brakes. I mean, why are you going to spend money when you're not sure what's going to happen on the other side? So you're going to slowly see employees get cut. I know there was a massive layoff in the beginning because all the part-time workers are essentially let go. But then once you've gone through that round of uh, cuts, now you're thinking, well, I'm going to hold on to my second tier of people just so that I can get back to operations relatively quickly. Uh, now we're being told sort of end of April, maybe, if we're lucky, back to work. And so you're going to start seeing another more deep round of cuts coming with the second level of people and ultimately hold on to your core group of uh, employees just so that you've got a management team in place to try and come back to business or what's left of it when you finally come back to work. Um, but if you think, I mean, one of my companies is in Hawaii, and that's based on the tourist trade. So we're looking at maybe August we might be back to normal at this stage because even if people were told get back to work in, uh, you know, end of April, you can't then go to your boss and say, hey, give me two weeks off. I want to go to Hawaii now. You've just had two months sitting at home. And most people will be in a state of panic, A, to hang on to their job and B, just to try and earn some money again. So you're probably going to see at least three or four months of downturn over there in the tourist market and uh, you know you've got your shipping problems the cruise liners you've got uh, all of the planes the airplanes the manufacturers and the, uh, the the actual delta airlines and people like that are burning billions of dollars so this this whole thought of a bounce back this i've seen the president say when we go back to work it's going to be like a rocket ship and it's not because as employers we've as i say made the initial cuts now we're going deeper and then when we all go back to work, we still have to sit down and determine what exactly are the orders going to be, how are we going to get paid, how are we going to then piece together our assemble our workforce again. And if you think of a manufacturer who is essentially shut down, they've got to fire up, they've got to buy the raw materials, they've got to rehire people, they've got to get themselves working, deliver the product, and eventually 90 days they get paid for what they've delivered. And so you need that massive cash infusion, but you've burnt all that on just trying to keep your doors open now. So I think it's going to be far deeper and uh, will be a huge recession, if not depression, on our hands at the speed we're going. Now, I should, uh, I should make everyone aware that Steve is... Uh, would you call yourself a bear, Steve? <laughs> Because I know I am. I wouldn't say I'm a bear. I hate to be bearish. I mean, it's, but I have been bearish for a while. The first reason I was bearish was because the markets just got overheated and we went way too far. So when you saw the market roll over recently and it came from, I think the S&P came from like 33, 3400 down to about 2400 where it is now. Um, you know, everyone's licking their wounds a little bit. But to me, that just brought us back to probably a level that was reasonable. And I don't really think the bear market started because I think people have took the market too far. So now you've got a situation where businesses have slowed down. You're not going to get that recovery that everyone's speaking of. And when Apple comes out, for example, and says, hey, by the way, our quarter isn't down 10%, our quarter's down 40%, um, I think then you're going to start wondering why it's a $1.1 trillion market cap. Uh, you know, it probably should be five, six hundred billion at most. So you, I think you've got forty, fifty percent more on the downside, easy. Yeah. So I don't know if you have price targets um, established for that yet, but um, I, I'm uh, officially short the market, which I, I hate to do. I never really enjoy being short because I don't like making money when the market goes down. If something feels wrong about it. But also, I hate losing, and I hate losing, especially when the market's going up. You know, that makes me feel like a real idiot. But this is just one of those situations where it seems super obvious. What about the stimulus, Steve? Because you own a lot of these businesses that you own are, are considered small businesses. Correct. Do you feel like there is anything in the stimulus um, that is to be optimistic about? Well, you know, it's sort of, it's the wild west out there, I swear. You, I used to run businesses and uh, trade stocks. Now I uh, fill in forms on the SBA website and uh, try not to lose too much sleep over investments. But, um, <laughs> no, the, the SBA site, it's changed in almost daily, but there is a ton of stimulus. Um, the other day when I tried to fill in the forms, it was so swamped you couldn't even fill a form in. The next day I came back and it was down for maintenance. <laughs> 
And then the third day I came back, and it's a lot more slick now and easier to get in, in your stuff in there. But now there's a button that you can press when you're filling your form and saying, hey, you know, uh, just uh, send me 10K quickly uh, while I'm filling these forms in. So, I mean, it's pretty bizarre that there's a more than sort of a, quite a high probability that you most companies will get that 10 grand at a minimum. Um, and that'll, of course, pay a couple of bills for some of us. Um, outside of that, they've just brought out this payroll, uh, um, past this payroll package where you can apply for two and a half times your average um, payroll for the last 12 months. I mean, that'll buy you some time as well, but that does come with some strings attached. But the both of those are actually forgivable. So you could, if you're a business, get that money in the door, keep your doors open for a little bit longer and not have to pay it back at the end of the rainbow. Um, so that is that is going to help, no doubt. But okay. it still doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, rush out and hire people and try and restart things when, you know, in, in the manufacturing world, you're being told you're not a business that's allowed to remain open. So how can you even employ people even if you wanted to? Yeah, it's a bizarre situation. There's a lot of companies, sports companies and uh, organizations and things like that who are trying to pay people even though it's not happening under the UFC, just paid their London fight card roster. They've p paid the fighters even though they can't have the event. Um, that's hard to do. You know, you got to be extremely well capitalized uh, to be able to to do something like that, which most small businesses absolutely are not. Um, anything, Correct. anything that requires people, gyms, restaurants, um, event centers, and things like that. Um, I, I do have one question for you, Steve. I'm just curious what you would have done. Let's say you were uh, the the ultimate decision maker. Uh, for the, the the country's monetary policy, and, and they said, you know what, Steve, we got two point two trillion dollars that we can inject in stimulus. How should we spend it? What would your answer be? Well, the first thing is that uh, now I think we're all getting twelve hundred bucks. I mean, in California, that's a rounding issue, right? It doesn't even cover a quarter of a person's rent, probably. And it might be good for the people in Oklahoma, but certainly not on the coast. So, you know, uh, that, and that only added up to about, it's, what was it, two or three hundred billion or something like that. I mean, if they'd actually increased that 10x to like, you know, 15 grand a person, then we'd be getting somewhere, I think. But it seems to me that most of the money's being spent on, uh, on large businesses and recapitalizing the banks. And I know the banks yep. are going to be hurting because this fallout's going to basically take everybody down. People aren't going to pay their mortgages. They aren't going to pay their rent. It's just going to have this complete contagion effect if we don't get back to work soon. And uh, I, I don't know really what they can do. I mean, you know, in terms of business, you start looking at the numbers and you go, okay, 100,000 dead people is a lot. I mean, that's not a, a small number. But uh, in terms of the population of 300 million, it's not, a, not very many. Right, and if you're going to have 300 million people unemployed and out of work, and you're going to basically wonder how to keep the economy afloat, and when it comes back on, people aren't going to get back into the workforce, and you're going to have a 30, 40 percent unemployment rate. I don't know. Was it worth it? That's the hard one. Yeah, that's the answer I don't have. Well, it's the it's the answer that's that no one has because it's an impossible thing to answer. I mean, it's uh you know it's the thing that we look at on a regular basis with alcohol. You know, hey, is it worth to sell this? So many people die in um, drunk driving accidents. Um, right. I mean, hey, even if you eliminate alcohol and all you know uh, substances that can be abused and impair the uh, ability for people to drive, then you still have people who just die in car wrecks just because they aren't paying attention or whatever. So mm -hmm. should we get rid of cars? Um, you know, it's a very, yeah, exactly. it's a slippery slope when you start going down that direction. But I, I feel like, you know, um, the administration here took, pre, you know, swift action on this and, you know, has taken severe action because it, you never know how bad it's going to be. And you don't want to see the worst case scenario on something like this. And I, I believe this is a moment right now, Steve, where we've got, this is a new thing. Um, there's going to become a, a normal thing down the road, unfortunately. Sort of like, I hate to use this example, but sort of like um, you know, mass shootings. And that was a rare thing that never happened. And then all of a sudden became more normal. And so now your, your kindergartners are doing active shooter drills at school. Um, 
And I think we're going to have to have more. We're going to have to. Businesses are going to have to be more prepared for this. Like imagine if there was a restaurant right now that was completely sanitary. In other words, had their own HVAC for each table, and you know they're all set up, and you could go in and like. It, it, Things may have to change um, on that front because I believe this is a moment where things are going to kind of change forever. And I wanted to ask you that question before we look at the stock market, Steve, because, you know, in my opinion, uh, it wasn't it wasn't enough. And if you're talking about two point two trillion dollars and you could pay off everybody, every single student loan, every single credit card in America with that much money. Um, All right. And I think that would have been a better use and required a lot less thoughts um, to just pay everybody's credit cards off and you know leave them in a situation where they can use their credit cards to survive for a little while, pay off their student loans, they don't have those payments anymore. You know that saves you money every single month, um, as opposed to a one-time you know payment. So well, the, the the problem, remember, is like, with that is it's like a tax, right? So there's no equitable tax. So I mean, if they did that, the students and people like me who've got a lot of businesses and got a ton of credit card debt would be saying, woohoo. Well, I, th I think there's already, but there's already programs, you know, available for people in that situation, you know, to get food yeah. and to get, you know, things and to get government assistance. Um, so anyway, I don't want to argue that with you, but before right. we talk to, <laughs> before we talk to the stock market, so I, I made you aware of a couple things. Number one, I'm short the market right now, which um, yeah. is not something I'm necessarily proud of, but worked out, you know, pretty well today. Uh, I have a feeling that. Do you have a price target for the Dow or the S and P, Steve? Uh, well, I won't get back into the S and P until it gets down to around about a thousand. You think a thousand? I'll, I'll start looking around then. You think it's going to get to a thousand? Well, just think back to oh eight oh nine, right? We were at uh, six sixty seven on the S and P. Uh, we didn't have this type of contagion. We had a financial issue. Uh, we didn't have 30, 40% of people out of work mm -hmm. and all businesses shut down and no one able to make any products or ship anything. Um, I think so. If you take that as just an example, I think we got to 10 or 12% unemployment and you had S&P at 667 and here we are 2,500 or 2,400. Uh, why wouldn't we get down to at least a thousand? Well, you you also had a lot of things though. Remember, Steve, back then that that's before uh, certain rules were put in place, like uptick rule and different things like that to protect the market from going down. And Wall Street was just stepping on the thing. Uh, we had a new, yeah. we had a new president who was was somewhat new to politics. I remember that was Obama's. You know, he first came, he came in in January of '09, and we hit the low in March of '09. I actually thought it was really right. smart of him to go on national TV and say, "I think people should buy stocks. Um, if it's this low, you should buy." And he did. He said that uh, shortly shortly around the, the bottom area. Um, maybe it was April of, of 2009 um, when he said that. But he didn't really know what was going. He was still trying to figure out what being president meant. So for guys to be coming to him and say, hey, we got financial issues, uh, this is a really big problem, it's really impossible for him to know the scope. We hadn't seen anything like that in such a long time. So I think we were caught off guard a lot more. By that one, I feel like this administration you know, has, has been around, has been in for a couple, three years, you know, two and a half years at this point. Um, and you know they're a little bit more financial, financially savvy. We're kind of ahead of this thing. So I think I'm a little more optimistic than you are, even though we're most, mostly bearish. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I think you got a lot of uh, confidence in A, the administration, and B, the uh, chiefs of the feds. Uh, I've never really had much confidence in them because it seems like the only thing they do is throw more debt at the problem. And I don't see debt really ever fixing anything. As I've been saying for a while, you're going to have to pay the piper back eventually. And so far, that hasn't had to happen. But, uh, I mean, yeah, they've certainly given the stock market every stimulus known to man. They've thrown this two trillion into the market in some way, shape, or form. And they've lowered interest rates. I mean, I was looking across my deck the other day. The only two uh, treasuries that are yielding more than 1% is the 20 year and the 30 year treasury. Everything else is sub one. And I've been saying for years we're going to zero and below. And, uh, I think the 10 year notes at half a percent now. So, um, you know, it, it, it's really just absolutely fleecing anyone who's trying to retire and save money and put it aside and earn a decent rate of return on their money. And the, in that world, they're just being killed because they have to go into the stock market or some maybe the property market if they can. But uh, it's really skewing the whole of the U.S. economy. 
economy towards stocks. And so you might be right, maybe they go up. But once again, when you have companies like Tesla and, uh, you know, Snapchat and, um, you know, WeWork and all these, you know, unicorns that are worth 20, 30, 40 billion, and in the case of Tesla, $100 billion, and they're losing a billion a quarter, uh, you, the market's gone insane. So, yeah, maybe investors get rewarded further, but that, to me, is not a market. That's just a casino. <laughs> I love the dose of reality uh, that uh, that Steve brings to. Uh, I mean, you, you think you think back to two thousand, right? Do you remember, you know, WorldCom and uh, yep. all those internet stocks yep. that went to zero, and they had billion dollar market caps, and people were getting a billion dollars. Now you've got a hundred billion dollar market caps, and they're losing just the same amount of money with no sight of ever making anything, and yet people keep buying more and higher, and up and up and up we go, and it's all just being piled on by zero interest rates. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's really just a, a tinderbox waiting to be lit. That's why in, in all reality, I mean, I've traded stocks since 1984, and I've got less than 1% of my portfolio in the market. I've just given up. It's just a mugs game as far as I'm concerned nowadays because you, you, can't, you can't buy anything of value and get rewarded. You have to buy momentum. And uh, and wait for it to get pulverized. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there's several strategies you and I have discussed over the years on the show, and one of them is, I believe the guy's name is Nassim Talib. Is that right? Yeah. Who yeah. has the you know the, every market crashes theory, and that's definitely working out right now for him, I'm sure. Um, but you know when you talk about inflation, so hear me on that because the Fed has said basically we will use as much ammunition as needed. We can print money. Did you all know that? Yeah. Um, so they basically said, hey, we'll do whatever. To, we'll liquidate everybody. Um, I mean, at that point, why not just give everyone a million dollars cash? Um, but, you know, where are we going to see inflation? Because I feel like it's going to be hard to see inflation really take place in prices of goods other than things that are like, like food. Um, like produce. No, I agree. I mean, you're going to have inflation in that, and you're going to have inflation in the medical side of things. That seems to be going up like crazy. But sure. um, outside of that, yeah, with oil at 20 bucks a barrel, there's no inflation coming from that side of the equation. I mean, that's right. going to deflate. Um, but, you know, there's uh, inflation's not an issue. And yes, they can print money, and they have been. Um, but is that money being used wisely? And at some point, you've got to, you know, pay this money back. I mean, that's do the you part though? That no one ever talks about. Do you? Uh, well, clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you you printed twenty four trillion, I mean, seriously, you think about it, and and what people don't understand is, I think we're twenty four, twenty five trillion in debt right now. In two thousand and eight, nine, when the the initial contagion happened in the financial world, I think the U.S. was two or three trillion in debt. Yeah. Now we're twenty four trillion in debt. Yeah. And it's the big, the big beneficiaries of that are business owners, people who've invested in stocks, property owners. So basically, if you've got an asset of some kind and it goes up in value, that's essentially where the money's gone. It hasn't really benefited the, the low income. The middle market's been squeezed out of the world. Um, I mean, capitalism in the U.S. is at one of its lowest levels ever because the playing field's been skewed towards big business with all the laws and rules and regs. So, I mean, your middle market is just sinking down into as a lower rent. It's not going up. There's no stair stepping. So you've got the biggest divide between the haves and the have-nots. And uh, it's going to at some point cause some kind of a social problem in this in this country or across the globe. But you think so? Once again, we can keep kicking the can down the road. Well, that's the, I think that's the um, that's the question is when 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 can you no longer kick the can down the road? That's what I'm asking. Where's the breaking point? Because if the Fed can just print money and print money and print money and fix these problems, and it may seem like a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, um, but if it stops the bleeding, people are going to well, be for it. Well, it does for a while, but I, I don't know. I really, you know, that's the, the trillion-dollar question, right? Because unfortunately, <laughs> everyone's doing it now. So if you, the way you juice your economy is you print money, you debase your currency, the dollar becomes cheap, you export like crazy, you, uh, you know, you bring the jobs home because it's better to make money to make the, the stuff here than pay expensive import prices because of all the, the difference in exchange rates. So that's what you do. But right now, everyone's trying to do that. But everyone's trying to push their currencies on. Everyone's printing money. Everyone's doing the same thing. So you're going to have winners and losers. But certainly when you see someone like Jeff Bezos and makes, uh, you know, something with 
you say, pay their mortgages, pay their school fees, pay their uh, medical bills, etc. Uh, the, the world's losing its losing the plot. I mean, and and the, the stock market set up to as a place for companies to go and get capital, not just to be a, a, a casino for trading. So I mean, it's just I don't know. I, I really lost a lot of faith in the whole thing. And um, as I say, just trying to to see what they do to fix it every time. I think the fallout here is is unfortunately the pensioners, retirees. I mean, I know a lot of retirees who are basically 90% stocks, 10% outside of stocks because where else can they get return? So, you know, if we drop another 30, 40% and they're down 60, 70% in their portfolio but still have to draw on that as their retirement plan, they're, they're in trouble. Well, I know I have the solution. Steve, what is that? and I know you know the answer. It's real estate. Real, wow, real, I think real estate is an option, yeah. It, it's the option because it's the one thing that doesn't really lie. It's the one thing that you know uh, there's an increasing demand on, a limited supply of. I mean, what else do we have that can give us those kind of macroeconomic situations? Yeah, I mean, if you can afford to get in there, yeah, then for sure. I think that helps. I think that uh, San Diego is sort of crazy expensive. I mean, you know, I look around at, and just take where we are now and the, the COVID uh, issues we have. And I look around where I live and basically every house is a million plus dollars. I mean, what house in San Diego isn't basically, right? A lot of them are. And you, yeah, and, and you go, okay, so here we go. There's an eight, ten thousand dollar mortgage on this house, and you're going to get twelve hundred bucks from your uh, from the government. And I mean, your savings are going to get eaten up fast by that mortgage. But I think if you're outside of California, I think there's a lot of opportunities, or if there's some investment funds that are doing pretty well. Uh, well, which, yeah. What, and, whether you, know, you buy a primary residence, though, would be different than like an entire retiree investment. Your your primary investment purchase is more of a hedge, right, against you know housing costs that you know right. are uncontrollable if you're renting. And uh, if you if you hedge by purchasing a house, and you at least know what your payment is, and one day that payment can go away, which is a, a great great thing. And I think that's the key that we need to get people to look at. Now, you're talking about retirees. Who are looking for return? Who are trying to, you know, right. get, get cash flow from their money so that they can live off of that and not, you know, burn the nest egg, if you will. Um, you know that that it can be done with income properties. I think, you know, the the commercial REITs are probably up on the chopping block. Um, if there was yep. like a, a ultra short commercial REIT ETF, I'd probably be all in on it. Um, there, there's going to be trouble there for sure. That's something that um, we've seen as sort of a macro trend taking place and, and, and moving forward. And I know you gave us a price target, Steve, with the um, S&P. You would get interested at 1,000. I'm just going to pull up the Dow here just so we can kind of see. This is the last week. And so, you know, I've been uh, just telling some people who've been paying attention to this that, you know, where we were looking here and where this thing was going to retrace to 22,500. It had trouble there to getting to this 22,500. As I was telling you guys, these, this spot right here, we tried to get through a couple times. Um, and this is where I got short right here. And as you can see, it's, it's moving lower and it just makes sense because, I mean, honestly, where is the good news? You know, where is the good news that's going to make a stocks sexy again? I mean, how far away is that, Steve? It feels like it's an eternity from here. Well, that's what I'm saying. Every day that they say, well, it's not quite yet, it's not quite yet, you know, the president, as I said a week or so ago, said, you know, uh, around about Easter, we're going to be back to work. And now he's second guessing that. He's saying, well, two weeks of, you know, real pain for America. Well, that takes us past Easter now. And if it's another two weeks, uh, you know, a week from now, and then another two weeks, I think you're going to really see people start questioning the, the viability of the businesses and the ability to be able to prosper and come back. And I think that's when the reality sets in. That's when you really see a rollover and a, and a complete you know, death knell. And that's going to be when businesses come out and start saying, well, we're going to give you a slight update on our next quarterly numbers, and they're not looking too rosy. That's, so, uh, yeah. That's that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting a lot of quarterly yeah. reports to be pretty ugly, and uh, yep. the trajectory of how quickly the stock market goes down is going to be based upon just how bad those are versus the estimates. So, as Steve mentioned, you know, if it, if Apple is expecting you know a 10 percent drop in sales year over year and it's 40 percent, um, that stock will get cut in half in a day or two. 
Um, right. And we just had the rollover of the quarter, um, which I think is also important. And I think it was another reason why, you know, the stocks were able to hold on a little bit yesterday. But today, kind of the gloves came off a little bit. We lost almost a thousand points. Uh, that quarter, you know, also makes sense uh, or is it is important time frame for different hedge fund managers and so forth who are going to get cash calls. Right. I mean, those those cash calls are going to come. Um, as people see what's happening in the market, they're calling their their hedge fund manager, or they're they're going into their uh, mutual fund, which only allows you to pull money out every 90 days or whatever it is, and they're going to say, "Yeah, request withdrawal. I want to get my cash back." And so I don't know if we've seen a lot of that sort of a run on stocks. I feel like that is coming, Steve. Am I out of my mind? No, I think you're right. I really don't think we have either. I think it's been, you know, yes, we've had a few really bad days. We've had a couple of, you know, big point days on a percent, on a point basis, but on a percentage basis, we haven't broken records yet. And I think we still are waiting for that. I mean, we came down, we went into a bear market and we bounced straight back out of it. It was the fastest bear market in history. Right? I think it lasts like three days or something ridiculous. <laughs> but I mean, we all know that that's not going to last long. We're going to be back in there pretty fast. But I just think that what people forget is just how overvalued the market was. And so if we back to a normal level of, uh, of value right now to the underlying stocks prior to the COVID virus, then with the COVID virus, I think you've got at least, you know, 20, 30, 40% more on the downside. And then as you're careening down, as you and I both know, uh, things you tend to, uh, over accelerate or shoot past true value and that's when you've got the opportunity to buy so i mean when you know going down and you're free falling uh, you typically can't just sort of put the brakes on oh here we are at a good value i mean people start getting panicked and scared and they just sell to sell and that's when you you know that's when i think you get down to my numbers i'm not saying a thousand should be the value but i'm just saying i think that's where you finally get to as you're just cratering down yeah, I mean, it's. I think that um, you know, when when we're really looking at this, and I have the stock chart up right now. This is sort of the long term Dow, and I I trade around the Dow. Some I'm very familiar with, and uh, traded Dow futures for a long time. So that's that's what I watch and what I feel comfortable sort of gauging the market off of. Although I know the S and P is where everyone's leaning these days, um, but for me, it's 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 about the movement in the Dow. It's a little bit more predictable. I I feel like and sort of behaves behaves itself. But right now we're in a situation where it's uh, it's blue ocean. I mean, we've never just shut down the the world economy before like this. Right. Uh, and not for economic purposes. That's the thing that's so b bizarre. And, um, you know, the crossover in, in the, the yield inversion, uh, the yield curve inversion that took place, what was it, in September of last year really is is the trigger and the signal for this. Um, and so, and it once again correctly predicted uh, what everyone is now calling a recession. How do we know, Steve, when this is a recession, or is it already? I think we're already in one. The problem with recessions is a lot of times you're already coming out by the time they go, "Ha ha, we're in a recession," because they need the numbers, right? And the numbers are obviously they say, like an accountant, they back into the future, but first. So I mean. You know, you, you got, they're always looking backwards, and by the time it's like, yes, we've got it counted, so it's three quarters that are, or, uh, you know, that are negative, then yes, recession, or three months are a recession, and then it's too late. We've already got it, uh, we've already been there, we've done that, we've printed those numbers, we're coming out the other side. So, you know, that's where the stock market oftentimes is already recovering, even though they're saying, yes, we're in recession, and then people are wondering, well, how come the stock market's on its way back up because it's forward-looking, and you should say, well, yeah, but that's the worst, that's behind us, and better times are ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to know, you know, exactly where that's going to be, but I just feel like the bad news, there's, unfortunately, for stocks, there's still a lot of bad news. Uh, three out of the last five recessions, Steve, tell me what you think about this. Three out of the last five recessions, of course, the last one was led by real estate. So we saw real estate take a big hit in the last recession that we experienced. But including that one, three out of the last five, we've seen real estate values go higher. I think this is one of those particular situations where we could see real estate go higher. And I know you mentioned earlier you think San Diego is expensive. But my question is compared to what? Because depending upon where you're looking, I mean, if you're looking in... Uh, Nebraska, yeah, 100%. Uh, 
um, it's going to look super expensive. But people come here from the Bay Area. People come here from certain areas of Canada, New York, even just L.A., or even Orange County. And they're like, man, everything is super cheap here. This is crazy. So I think... Yeah, it, no, I agree with that. I'm just thinking that it's expensive in comparison to your average wage you can earn in San Diego. That's the number I'm looking at. Okay. I mean, so I'm not saying that in comparison to those other cities it's cheap. Yes, agreed. But when you go to San Francisco, you expect to earn probably double what you're going to earn in San Diego, right? That's a good question. I'm not sure what the average uh, wages are there versus here, but you know, just uh, just in general for the real estate itself, and I think there's a ton of economic opportunity in San Diego that is not being uh, taken advantage of right now. We have some good things going in biotech, and I think biotech is going to continue to be a very big growing industry. And in fact, that's one of the, if you want to say it, uh, you know, a silver lining to this coronavirus situation is there's going to be a, a surge in biotech. Mostly, I think, on the preventative side, Steve, you know, biotech has been a big um, sort of, you know, reactionary thing uh, up until now. And I think you're going to see more proactive solutions coming. Like, imagine if you, you know, you walk into a restaurant and they give you a certain kind of swab that you put over your mouth and your hands. And that supposedly kills, you know, uh, all these different potential viruses or something like that. Um, I mean, you know, th there's going to be some innovation, I think. So I think we've got biotech. Biotech is going to be very good. We have technology here. I think we're going to steal, especially if this is a recession and it does hit hard, some of those very expensive areas like San Francisco, like Los Angeles, like Orange County. Those people are going to say, you know what? I've done well the last decade. This has been great. We've got money in the bank, honey. You know what? Why don't we slide down to San Diego and get a beach pad and just chill? And I'll find a job down there. No problem. I'll start my own business, heck. So I think you're going to see a little bit of a migration down into San Diego as well as it, as it turns out to be a place that's a discount from some of those more expensive, higher flying metropolitan areas um, that are nearby, or at least let's say on the same latitude that we are. Um, so I think that I think real estate has a really good chance in this recession to actually do very well. Am I crazy, Steve? No, I mean, the other thing you haven't mentioned, which is obviously a massive driver of real estate, is the interest rates. So most people are buying real estate, they're buying the payment stream, right? Yep. So if you've got interest rates, which as I mentioned earlier, the 10 years are around half a percent, and uh, I've got a lot of people contacting me when they could get a mortgage at around about 4% going, oh, look at me, and now they're going, geez, I'm going to refinance at 285 and. I'm saying to them, just stick around. You're probably going to get one and a quarter soon, you know. <laughs> um, then, I mean, seriously, it's, uh, so, you know, if, if you've got a one and a quarter interest rate, I mean, I've been looking at real estate in Portugal, of all things, and um, uh, interest rates there on mortgages are 1%. Really? Um, yeah. And uh, in uh, places like uh, um, uh, Denmark and places like that, they've actually got a few spots where it's been... Um, uh, negative interest rates on your mortgage. So essentially, almost you're just sort of getting the house given to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what? I mean, this is what's going on around the world, and we don't think we've lost our marbles, right? Um, but anyway, wow. Um, so, yeah, if you think you can get a 1% interest rate on a property, so essentially your whole mortgage is going to be just every payment's just principal, then yeah, it certainly gives the real estate a boost. Uh, well, what it does do, and the thing that I think you're going to see just evaporates pretty soon, will be that whole uh, um, idea of uh, mortgage relief on your taxes from the interest rates. Because where's the interest rate benefit when your interest is only one or one and a half percent? Even if you got a million dollar mortgage, right? You only got fifteen grand in interest maximum. So you know that that when you think back in the good old days of interest rates at six seven percent, it made a huge big difference to get that mortgage relief. But if everyone's refinancing down, I think you'll probably see that get scrapped. But I don't think that has an impact anymore. People are more looking at the payment, not yep. the tax impact. Yeah, no, you're hundred percent correct. They are, and um, and maybe maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong for doing that, but. Rates are really good, and I normally do mention that um, when I when I do these videos, I show the mortgage rate chart. I don't know if you saw this or not, Steve, but just to give you an idea, I know you're not a huge fan of the Fed. Uh, well, let's put it this way: you, you've you've noted some of the the Fed's mistakes in the past, and their sort of ongoing um, willingness to just throw money at problems that no one has to pay back. Um, so here's what they did to try to lower mortgage rates or keep mortgage rates low: they they spent 250 billion dollars buying mortgage bonds. Yep. And the unintended consequence, which we felt the last 10 days or so in the mortgage industry, is that, you know, 
mortgage companies, when they receive a lock, you know, when someone locks their rate, they, they hedge that by shorting the bond, right? And so they actually blew the prices up so much that there were margin calls on the hedge. And they blew out a whole bunch of mortgage companies, blew out through their stops, blew out the margin call, margin call, margin call on all of their hedges. Oh, uh, funny. So they were all completely well, naked. Pretty amusing. I thought you might find that funny. Not funny, but it's one of those things where, you know, it was like, Damn it! You know, they, it's like, hey, Fed, we're thirsty. Cool. Here's a fire hose. You know. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, you think about uh, uh, unintended consequences, and you've just mentioned one. I mean, another unintended consequence. There's two that I can mention briefly. But the first one is, if you think, you know, a lot of us have life insurance, and a lot of the life insurance is pinned to the stock exchange, and you can set it so that you don't lose money on the downside, but you only capture a portion of it on the upside. Um, yeah, and that's a great way to hedge your bets and stay in the market and earn a slight premium on it. And I know the insurance companies, you know, they make money on the spread and they're also getting the, the premiums against the insurance policy and that. But the majority of the returns in the insurance world is based on bonds and the interest received on the bond market. And you've taken that market to zero, essentially. So I think you could see some big implosions coming in the uh, in the insurance world or else premiums going up because they're going to have to price that in somehow. Um, so that's one thing that, that could have an unintended consequence of this whole low interest rate environment. And then the other thing that you've seen, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Japan, I mean, they've been trying to stimulate their economy for 30, 40 years and they're really still not getting anywhere. But they've done the same methodology as the Fed here, which is just keep tossing money and tossing money and tossing money. And then obviously Japan is a lot smaller economy than the U.S. But um, after years, as their balance sheet grew bigger and bigger and bigger, and there was really no more bonds and people weren't interested in their bonds, they are dead, dead like the Fed is just eking into now. They started in the commercial real estate market, and then they started in commercial uh, um, bonds, and then they started ran out of stuff to go there, and now, then they started buying stocks in the stock market, and now the Bank of Japan is essentially about 60% of the whole of the Japanese market. Wow. So you're talking about Big Brother. <laughs> and, and that's starting to happen here. I mean, when I read that they're now buying commercial loans and commercial debt, and they're starting to do, as you mentioned, in the real estate world, they're starting to step in. I mean, Big Brother's here now, and uh, the more they're throwing trillions and trillions of dollars into this market, they have to start buying something. And there's not enough uh, of their own garbage out there, so they're going to start buying the private stuff. Wow. Wow. And so, you know, is that really a, a free market economy anymore? Yeah, that's uh, and that's the big question for me is just, you know, when, you know, when 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 can you no longer kick the can? When is it so deformed that it can't be kicked any further and we have to face whatever it is is the the ultimate ending of this, which is it's all just monopoly money, it, you know. Wh wh at what point does the does the Fed does it not make sense for the Fed to print money well, and things like that? Yeah, it all comes down to just, uh, I mean, it's consumer confidence, right? 100% so sentiment. If you haul, open your wallet and haul out one of those uh, pay, pieces of paper that's in there, it might say 20 or maybe it's 100. I don't know what it says in your wallet. Maybe it says 1. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that's all it really is, is a piece of paper. And it's got a value that we've all perceived is a value. And that's because we still believe that that value, or 20 bucks or whatever it is, actually has that value. But at some point, when everyone loses faith in the Fed, then the whole value of it goes to zero. And then, you know, then you've got problems. But until that happens, until you have a loss of, of confidence from the consumers and the world and the leaders and the, the whole, you know, uh, system, then you can keep trucking. And to your point, you can just keep printing like they're doing. Yeah. Who cares? This if is, you uh, think about a budget deficit, I mean, the U.S. last year in the boom time printed a 1.4 trillion deficit, and we've already printed two more trillion this month, right? On top of the 1.4, we're probably going to run a four trillion dollar deficit this year, at least. Wow! That's... I wonder what everyone's going to say when that shows up. Yeah, well, that's just such a massive amount. It's crazy, um, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, today, Steve, so much. And I have one, I have one more question for you. Yes, sir. Oil, okay. Am I? Yeah. I bought oil this week, 
Am I an idiot? Are we? Is this the end of oil, or is this just a price war and a slow economy and, a, and a, just the stars aligning against this thing? Yeah, I, I would think you probably done a reasonable job. I mean, could it go to ten, twelve dollars a barrel? I remember that. Not that old, so it couldn't be that long ago. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it did get down there a while ago, and everyone predicted the end of oil. And then, of course, as we know, it went from that to 140. So I don't think it's the end of oil. I certainly think that there's a lot of industries that are beneficial from this low oil price, um, you know, and the people that are obviously like miners and things like that. And I don't think you'll ever see really the oil die that fast. It's not like we've all gone out and bought electric cars and stuff like that right away, yeah? yeah. So I think you're probably good. I mean, whether it'll ever get to 140 again is a question mark, but certainly I can see it back to, you know, 40 $50 a barrel. And if you're getting in a 20, that's a nice ride. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time today, brother, man. I really, really appreciate you doing this, letting us know what you're seeing and what's going on. Uh, super helpful, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dick. All right, Steve. Appreciate you, brother. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, that is Steve Bick, ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> someone that I've been leaning on for years uh, to just have an understanding of what the heck is going on. If uh, you have a question for Steve, let me know. Um, I will definitely ask him. We'll have him back on the show as well throughout um, this process just so that we can all know what the heck is going on. Steve owns multiple businesses. He has his own portfolio fund that he manages as well which the whole purpose of is to try to earn you know, income for retirees and things like that. So you know, he's got a lot of moving parts in this economy and he's also very well versed in how it all works and that's why he's a good person to listen to. And you'll notice when I brought up real estate, and this is a guy who's very honest, very straightforward, he's thought about all this stuff. I brought up real estate and what did he do? He said, you might be right. Actually, that makes sense. He said, no, 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 I wasn't saying it was expensive necessarily. When I challenged him on that, um, he did sort of agree with me and I wanted to see where he was at with that because um, you know I, that's really my belief we've never seen anything like this before so we have no idea what's gonna happen obviously nobody does I'm super optimistic though I still feel like there's a lot of really good things and remember we were trucking along extremely well we just hit the pause button unfortunately we hit the pause button we all didn't just freeze you know we all still here have to do stuff have to work out of our house you get to see my Mario background um, you know so it's just, it's changed things. I think we'll find efficiencies in this. I believe in America. I believe in Americans. We're not Americans, right? We're Americans. And we are going to do this. And I, I believe that real estate is going to be the safe haven that everyone's looking for. Look, what else can you trust? Look at the things that he was mentioning. The 10 year is at like half a percent. A lot of these bonds, in order to get to 1% yield, he was talking, you got to get to the 20 year or the 30 year bond. So where are you going to get, you know, return? Where are you going to get income? Where Where is there safety in investing? One place it's always been. It's always been real estate. Because that's the one thing macroeconomically. Remember when I asked Steve this question very specifically. Hey, macroeconomically, what else is there that has an increasing demand and a limited supply? Because no matter what, you got to live somewhere. So you're either paying your mortgage or you're paying somebody else's mortgage. But someone owns the place that you live in. Someone pays a mortgage on it, whether it's you or someone else. And so, you know, that that has to be there. I don't feel like we're overbuilt. I don't feel like we have this supply. Remember last time, you know, before the crash, not only did we have the liar loans, but we also had tons of inventory. We had tons of new builds. We had all kinds of new homes and new construction. And Temecula, I remember going up to Temecula right when the crash began and seeing entire neighborhoods where there was one person living there. We don't have that. We don't have we don't have that going on right now really anywhere even if i go back to missouri when i do go back to missouri and i look at the real estate and what's going on there they can't build the houses fast enough there before they have a house built they already have the buyer so we just we have a different situation now than what we've had in the past and i think real estate is going to be the answer for a lot of people not just for income for retirees but also as a hedge and as a long-term investment for freedom for every individual in this country. And that's why I promote it. That's why I believe in it, because it is the one thing that I believe we can count on in a, in a world in which financially it's hard to count on really anything. So please share this uh, with your friends. Let's help make them 